the idea of wakefulness states modulating conscious access, it's, it's an idea between the clash of two aspects of consciousness, the conscious level and the conscious access. And we'll chat about this uh, you know, a bit more in detail, but that's the key of the talk that we tend to, you know, people who are psychologists, classic psychologists and, and cognitive neuroscience, they tend to work in consciousness. They, sooner or later, you end up doing one experiment or you vacate your life, I don't know, um, to conscious access, you know, present stuff that sometimes it's unconscious, sometimes it's conscious. And then if it's, you know, if it's reported as, oh yeah, it was that, then the people say, oh, it was consciously detected. So that's what I mean by conscious access. Unconscious state, I don't need to tell you too much, particularly this group, but you know, it could, it could be many different things. So we will just comment. One of the most obvious one and simple to work with is sleep. Uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about between being awake and falling asleep, not being asleep, because if you're asleep, you don't really respond with, you know, button presses. And we are here to look at psychophysics. Um, so if we start, let me see if I can move the thing. Yeah, good. If we start a little bit uh, uh, about se separating form of consciousness, you can see here, you know, a, a variety of opportunities to, to work on consciousness in, in many different ways. Here, in, in, in particular, um, we're going to be centering on this idea of drowsiness. And the idea of drowsiness, it's a, it's a pervasive idea. I mean, throughout the talk, the 40 something people are here, one of you, two, three, probably three or four, 10% will become drowsy. I don't take it personally. I've been working on drowsiness for 10 years. I couldn't care less if you get drowsy because I know I'm not boring. I learned that through my life. I know it's on you, okay? So don't feel bad because I don't feel bad. And also, you know, don't put the camera on because we are not, you know, in a talk. In a talk, I would normally wait until the end of the talk and if someone was drowsy, I will approach this person and shame that person. But I won't be able to do that today. So that's a shame, literally. Um, so we, we're gonna be working on drowsiness. And if, if I you know, um, have the you know, opportunity to call you to the lab and do this experiment, um, most of you will get um, relaxed and a proportion of you will get drowsy even while doing something. So that's what the lab has been doing, one of the, one of the areas of work in the lab has been making the people do stuff while they're getting drowsy. And that's the general aspect of the toy model. So you could be fully awake and you come to the lab and we put the EEG and you're getting a chest long and we, you're doing a very boring task that it's, you know, sometimes an, a sound comes and you have to take a button press and you're getting relaxed and a bit more until you're drowsy or on the verge. On the verge is this sort of, you know, am I asleep, not sleep? If you never play the game of I am asleep, am I asleep? You can do it tonight. Um, some people really like the game to know whether uh, am I still aware or I'm in, I'm in the sleep and then they wake themselves up. And then you get the proper end to true sleep of unconsciousness. So today we're gonna be working between fully awake and drowsy. And we're going to define these two states, the fully awake and the drowsy by EEG markers. Salud, Atena. Um, and the idea is that one year, while you're going down in this level of consciousness transition, while you're transitioning from fully awake to drowsy to later other, you know, later stages of uh, N2 sleep, it could be that cognition is fragmented. We know cognition is fragmented because if you're driving and you're getting drowsy, you might crash or you might be less good at controlling stuff. So we know there is less cognitive capacities when you're getting drowsy. The question is, a bit more of the detail, you know, of that. So today you're going to see all of these slides. Uh, there's a couple of hidden slides to answer a specific question, but these are all the slides of today. Um, hopefully you've seen these three slides that I just you know, shown and these meta slides, so the slide of the slides. And from there, I'm going to walk you through a little intro, then a theoretical uh, aspect of conscious access here in white. And then all of these lovely graphs with results are the, the talk in itself with the paper um, that it's under review now. Um, but the Vio Archives version is, is there online and you can find it and read the detail if you want. And then I run for three slides and I close. So that's the plan. So whoever wants to go and get a tea now that you have seen the talk already, you can. Uh, if not, you can stay while I do a bit more of introduction of about the general question.
So um, if you see here, there's always um, a queue for the next uh, slide. So if you're getting you know, bored of what I'm saying in particularly, uh, and I see that your eyes is, are going down, I'm going to assume that you really want me to go to the next slide. Um, and this is possible with the camera, I've seen it already. So in the, in the lab, we did several experiments of people doing stuff while getting drowsy. These are four of the, this one. Okay. One is the one we're going to be talking today. It's better on the review. You know, a lot of us for many years and, and others in the, in the, that have come through that. And then we have another three other experiments where we see a similar effect. So in a classic psychophysic curve, there's something that it's, you know, that it's easy or difficult. So this is the easy one, 100% hits and difficult, very low hits. Um, and this is what we call, you know, the, the point of the threshold when you're, you know, half and half, you half time, you, you know, half of the time you say, oh yeah, that was, that was there. The other time you say, no, it wasn't. In fact, it, all, it was always there. So this is the conscious access task. We'll talk about the detail later. The important thing is when you're drowsy, the task goes from this psych psychophysic curve, you know, sigmoidal to a little bit, you know, less slope. And this is not only for this task. So here the people were deciding whether they felt something in the hand or not after the TMS. We pulse the TMS, the, the hand moved. You say, yes, oh yeah, yeah, of course, I detected it. You know, higher intensity of the TMS. And sometimes the TMS will be below your threshold. Um, so you're less likely to detect it. And that's what you see here. Yet again, with differences, what you see in drowsy is that you, the slope of that psychophysic curves also gets, you know, smaller. Another task, spatial attention task, if it's left or right, that's the stimulus angles of the left or the right in sounds. Yet again, the blue is the drowsy also, same effect, same effect with the sound discrimination task. So what we see in here is a general effect of getting drowsy that transforms a classic any cla almost any classic task where you have to take a binary decision. Was it coming from the left or the right? Was the sound there or not? Was, did I feel my hand move or not? Uh, did I hear this or that? Everything that you can parameterize in terms of difficulty, angle, amount of masking, you know, intensity of the TMS. It seems to me that the change that we see is not a threshold change. In this case, there's a little bit of threshold. That's the only change. All of the others don't have a general, you know, big threshold change. They have a change in the in what what is called the you know the the clarity of the effect, the nonlinear effect. When the things are really easy, you're almost almost hundred percent. When the things are really difficult, you're almost at zero percent. Anything else, it's you know in between. The sharpness of that is what it seems to be changing in all of these tasks. Let's zoom in the task we are interested in. Um. <clears throat> And before going into zooming, I, I zoom in into what this means for conscious access, I need to do two introductions. One is the method to define drowsiness. The other one is conscious access itself. And that's why we have the next 10 minutes on that. And then we're going, going to go straight back into results. So if you, of course, if you, if you Google the, uh, the, you know, the, the paper or the manuscript, you can find it. It says, you know, this is uh, the last version that Valdas posted. There's a new version coming in. Now we reply to, um, to uh, several uh, reviewers comments. A lot of people work on this project. Uh, um, in particular, Amy and Naurina and Markevichute did a lot of data collection of 60 people. Um, and then, you know, Valdas did, did most of the work in creating the pilot and you know, do the analysis, et cetera, et cetera, and many other people uh, help. Um, so if you are awake and I'll ask you to come to the lab and we put the EEG and we let you fall asleep while doing a task, very boring task, and you're falling asleep, and this is in, you know, um, in quite a few minutes, wait. You can see that at the beginning, you have your classic alpha that you have, the alpha at around 10 hertz with your eyes closed. So you close your eyes, with EEG, we see your alpha. As the time passes, you start to lose your alpha and a little bit of, you know, slow wave-like thing, theta type stuff, um, or 
X or even delta start to appear. So while your alpha is going down, your theta is, theta is coming in. And sometimes you still have your alpha when you're really drowsy. Um, so all of this is not, none of this is really true sleep. So this is a particular subject who, who never reached the point of, oh, M2 sleep, you know, with spindles and on the whole lot. This is really drowsiness. But the interesting thing is when it was quite late drowsiness in this part, the person almost, you know, never responded. So you have here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, 10 responses in, you know, 20 minutes. Um, while here was responding all the time, except a few that it missed. Look at this one. You look, you trace back and you see, you know, what it missed. It missed there, it missed there. Um, so the, the, the funky stuff about this is that uh, while the person is sort of, alpha, you know, alpha nice, uh, relaxed or, or, or fully awake, you have your reaction times and your response is variable maybe, but there. As soon as the thing starts to crumble, you get into this sort of weird space where sometimes you have a few misses responsive, the variability is it's sort of funny. And, and that is something we can characterize a bit more in detail. So in the eighties, this guy in Japan, Hori, he separated the whole N1 that any sleep researcher says, oh, N1 is one thing, right? It's awake, N1, N2, what we call true sleep. N1, it's something that he separated in nine, you know, in nine sub, sub, you know, subspecies of brain activity or patterns. And that's what we're going to use. So you have your alpha trains when you're fully awake. You have a reduction in the alpha when you get, you know, a bit more relaxed. Further relaxation goes into almost disappearance on alpha. Then you have flattening ripples, vertex sharp waves when you are approaching the first part of sleep, but you're not truly sleep. You're still in, in N1. You still respond sometimes in this. And then if you have a spindle, so okay, complexes, you are in the true sleep. So this, this separation, you know, uh, should we develop a, you know, a series of uh, funky algorithms to, to separate this? You can calculate it by the proportion between alpha and the theta. These ripples are theta. So if you have no alpha and you have some theta, you're around here, you know, three, three, four, five, six, where is the drowsiness when you're still responding. And we have done a lot of experiments to actually find about this. So this is a this is a moment of the mist of consciousness, where the people think most of the time that they're okay to drive and they're really shit at driving and they're likely to have an accident. That that little part is what our idea as a, as a, you know, transitions of consciousness lab is to try to keep the people oscillating between that part, that part where they sometimes respond, um, you know, accurately, sometimes respond not so well, so they're not very, not the, not the sharpest, um, and the comparison to the, themselves in the same session, but fully awake or sharp. If there's something not clear, you know, you can sort of, you know, just unmute yourself and ask me a question. I don't have any problem. There are not that many slides, so we can we can you know evacuate uh, doubts if it's needed. So if you you know if you study formally you know um, modern psychology, you will have a, a most likely a lesson or even a series of lessons in, in cognitive neuroscience where you will see the model of Stanley and Lionel Lacache from 2001, which is the conscious access classic model from the global neuronal workspace. Uh, if you haven't, doesn't matter. I'll tell you a little bit about it. If you have, then you can, you know, criticize me of not being truthful to the model. I don't mind. Um, so the model says that if the information is subliminally processed, so you present something very briefly in the in the corner of an eye or mask, you know, in the middle of you know a lot of noise or very faint that you just barely hear it or see it, um, it could be that the information here, visual cortex, you know, it sort of gets, uh, gets, you know, processed in V1, and it sort of climbs, climbs up and down, but it doesn't really sort of, you know, expand into the whole brain processing of saying, oh yeah, it was there, I detected it, oh yeah, it was that that I, I that I saw, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if the same, you know visual or auditory stimuli um, 
just by the change, change of the noise in the brain gets detected. So the same amount of energy gets detected um, and um, reverberates enough in the brain, it will be picked up by you know, the reporting system, the conscious capacity of saying, yeah, it was that what I saw. Or yes, I saw something, I'm pretty sure, let me think about what it is. So you become aware. So this is the, this is the idea of the model between something that enters the workspace, this sort of hyper-connected middle part. So something is conscious, strong, it goes from V1, V2, and goes up in visual cortex until it reaches this sort of hyper-connected hub of the thalamo parieto frontal big hub. Uh, and that's the underlying idea of the global neuronal workspace. If it's subliminal, it sort of um, enters, but it, it sort of dies down before entering this big hyper-connected you know, network of the brain that it's supposed to be the underlying, you know, neural correlate of consciousness or the mechanisms by, the, by, by which we become aware of something. And there's a full computation model done early in 2000s um, with, you know, with many details about that function, you know, computational model that I just wanted to mention, but I'm not interested in the computational aspect today, although we can talk about it. I prefer to give you the, the classic example. The classic example in conscious access, you know, literature for the global neurology is this paper from Antoine de Coul, um from 2007. So, um, in this case, you're, you, the participant is looking at the, at the cross in the middle, and uh, this, you know, the target is flash for 60 milliseconds. There's a variable time in between, and then a mask is applied to that target, which the mask, if the time in between the target and the mask is short, this mask will actually mask. The target so we will make it unconscious or will render it unreportable right? meaning i show you this and i show you the mask fast enough you are you you might have the impression that something flashed but you can't say what it is you can't tell me if it's higher or lower than five okay of course if i leave 100 milliseconds in between the target and the mask you have plenty of processing time that the mask doesn't you know, mask anymore. It's just this very weak mask. So it really, it's just a little veil, but you still saw, you still managed to see there was a six, a seven, a three. Um, and that's how it's, that's exactly what it's sort of represented here. Um, that, you know, the, the fraction of correct trials. So you're almost a chance, you know, practically a chance when the, when the time between the target and the mask is very short, in this case, you know, 60 milliseconds, the more time I give you, the more likely you are, you know, to be correct in saying whether the six, you know, six was, you know, was a, was a number higher or, or lower than five. So that's the underlying idea of what is called the conscious access dynamics. Depending on how much masking I give you, how, how likely is that you break, you know, uh, the process in into consciousness. So if I, if I give you this sort of 50 milliseconds, you know, most of the time, you know, you're correct. Sometimes this, even at 50 milliseconds time in between the mask, uh, and between the target and the mask, sometimes the people still, you know, um, are, you know, are wrong and, and they just don't, don't see what's going on. Um, and here you have the threshold, right? That you can, you can look at there um, and what will be the halfway between these things. This is, this is, you know, Sometimes you get, you know, at the at the flashing point. So we'll 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 talk about it when we see the neural. So that model I was telling you about can be represented for this spe specific experiment. At the time, what they said is in the early visual cortex, independent on on the mask, as soon as the target appears, doesn't matter what, what how many masks I put. If I put the mask early or late, V1 will always see. You know, we'll always have a, a brain activity to, to that target. So you get this, you know, brain activity and it's independent of the mask itself. So it's always almost the same intensity. Um, if you go to higher visual, air, visual areas, so up, you know, up, up the ventral stream, you will, the, the model says, the, the computational model says that this is linear with 60 milliseconds, 33, 50, 66, you know, 70 something, 100, you know, the, the linear change in the 
in the time between the target and the mask, so the linear change of the par external parameter, uh, the brain activity will scale with that, will be linear to that. So that's, that's part of the linear uh, aspect of you know, neural processing. And in frontal areas or areas related to the global workspace, neuronal workspace, which is the frontal parietal and the thalamus, which is not represented here, you will have this, you know, neural um, signal that it's related to the actual response, to the actual being aware or not aware of it. And, and in that sense, everything that was presented too fast and we were subliminal, and the person was just basically, I don't know, I'm just guessing, here it would be no brain activity or very little, which we are almost in this case, right? But if we are, the person actually, yes, it, it, bro it broke through, you know, the barrier and became part of the global neural workspace, then the brain activity here will be reverberating and stable and will stay high. And that would, you know, predict that the person was actually conscious and being able to respond with relatively nice, um, uh, amount of confidence and then you can have a threshold which they are like not so sure and they're like you know not really subliminal but you know so that's the actual threshold of the psychosophistic curve so this is the model and this was you know proposed early earlier than 2007 then they was tested in 2007 by by Antoine and, and Stan um, and this is the brain activity they show so again you know the model is this this is what they got so you can see here it's a bit more messy. They still sort of claim that in the frontal cortex, as you, as you see here, you get this sort of subliminal threshold and then, you know, when the person is yes, pretty sure what they've seen, they have higher activity. So they have this sort of non-linear aspect of it. This, you know, non-linear-ish. And in the ventral areas, what before was this one, they, they, they sort of see this linear increasing with the amount of you know time in between the mask and the so this 2007 paper was the inspiration to the for the discussion we had with Valdas you know years and years later to try to re replicate this effect in auditory space so instead of doing it visually we do it auditorily but also we will see how we modulate this conscious access by we modulate it by drowsiness so that's the gain the physiological system of the sleep coming into the wakefulness modulates the cognitive system of conscious access. So it's almost like two systems of the brain separated. One is like uh, less than a second processing of precision of something that is really faint versus a slow process of minutes or you know, pushing the system into another state. In nonlinear, in classic nonlinear dynamics, you have two states that are metastable, and and you have transitions between them, right? That's they are awake and sleep, and you know, and light sleep. In between that is N one. So we're trying to catch the people in the middle as they are transitioning, but they're not quite there yet. So because they're still able to respond, and this is where we are. That's the that's the underlying idea that we we can calculate in each person. You know the the little gain of the wakefulness or the homeostasis into the cognitive system. In this case, conscious access. Um, now everything would be fine, and if this was a talk, you know, for for uh, you know for uh, undergraduates, I would stop there. You know, linger more time in in the model of conscious access, global and neural workspace. But I'm, I have to say that. Um, the idea that the brain activity related to conscious processing, it's mainly seen at the, at the frontal cortex in late processing around 400, 300, 400 milliseconds has, has some evidence against that idea that you can actually have brain activity that differentiates between being aware and unaware um, earlier. So you have brain activity that in around 200 milliseconds or sometimes even faster, you can have uh, neural markers of awareness in itself, okay? And this is important because um, if there is no change in what I'm presenting and I separate hits, so when I say is there and misses, when I say it is there and it wasn't, 
um, sorry, and it was, then, then I'm separating my, my only change of awareness, but the, the world doesn't change. I'll show you in the next slide. So what I'm saying is there are a series of experiments and also theoretical proposals that say that the actual um, breakthrough at the neural level it's much earlier than that, those 300 milliseconds frontal cortex thing. So it's okay to be on the side of Stan the Hen, you know, Global Neural Workspace and many of its defendants. And I, and I did a postdoc in, you know, there in Paris. And, you know, I was very convinced that this was a great model and a lot of evidence, but there's also very clear evidence that this can happen earlier and maybe slightly different in the mechanism. So that's part of what we, you know, what I want to show you at the end of the talk, the discussion about the, you know, the, you know, what the evidence tells us about uh, theories. Right. Let's go into the into the experiment in itself. The experiment is is relatively simple and very similar to the one I just described in, in visual. You have uh, some time, you know, four, five, six, seven seconds, uh, you know, before we present a little stimuli. The stimuli is the target, a little tone, deep, really small tone. Um, and then between the tone and the mask, the mask is like a <laughs> auditory mask. You have your eyes closed, you hear a tone, and, you, and then a mask. <laughs> um, and the time in between is what, you know, what it changes, right? You know, and, and this is exactly, so if the, if the mask is very near the target, so the tone deep and the mask are very close, you have the impression that the target wasn't there. So 95% of the trials, the target is there. So you hear, and you, you don't know if you heard the target. In fact, many times you say you didn't hear the target because you think it wasn't there. So the game, of course, is that you leave the world stable, but the brain will sometimes detect that the target was there and sometimes would not, and hence, you will say, you will become aware, oh, yeah, it was there. No, it wasn't. And that's only on you. That's in your brain variance about detection. It's not on the world. The world presented the brain activity. Um, sorry, the world presented the, the same thing always, which is the, the, the target and the mask. So that's, you know, that's the conscious threshold, right? Sometimes with the world doesn't change, but sometimes I say, yeah, it was there. So, oh, it wasn't there. So that's, that's the most important part of understanding this. Of course, if the stimuli, um, if, the, if the mask moves around here, then you have a lot of time to hear the tone, process it, and then the mask doesn't mask, as we said before. This is what you see here that I show you in slide three. The red one is, you know, when you're awake and the condition is fairly easy, so you, the, the, this mask is far away from the stimuli, so you hear the beep, then you're most of the time you're correct and you say that the mask was there when it was there. So this is the percentage of hits. When the, the target, you know, the, the little tone has the mask very near, you're most of the time, um, you know, you don't have many hits. So you have a difficult condition. And then you have things in between, right? Now, the threshold here between being awake in, in red and being drowsy in blue doesn't change. But of course, what we see is that we have this change in the slope. And what is interesting, if I look at the 31 participants of the, of the 60 participants, the 31 participants who they had nice psychophysics of each of them in both, in both conditions, awake and drowsy. So we had enough trials and a good fit to be able to do it per subject. So in this 31 subject, if you look at the threaded change, in the group, it still is, you know, it's around zero. So uh, some people have a threshold change one side, some people have a threshold change the other side. So there is a threshold change, but it is not dependent, it's not systematic in people. Now the slope, if I look at all the participants, yes, a few people have the slope that is slightly higher, one is actually much higher, and the overwhelming, the overwhelming majority of, of these 30 something people, when they're drowsy, the, the slope goes down. And this is at the, at the single subject level. Um, Chris? This is not, yeah. What is the unit of this, uh, of the uh, y axis of this C panel? This, the, the, the y axis, oh, here. 
This is this is the this is an arbitrary unit of uh, change of the threshold. Um, the slope is the actual you know change in the slope, the mathematical uh, fitting of the of a of a linear fit. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so what we want to say here is that this wasn't so surprising for us because we were seeing this in other experiments. Um, but it was it was useful to see that there maybe there is some there is a systematic effect of drowsiness on you know on cognition, which is that it changes somehow the precision of the system. So the more the you know the, the sharper you are, the more precise you are. So the difficult the difficult ones you have almost no hit, so you say it wasn't there, um, and when it's there, you know, in, and it's easy, you say it's there. So clearly, the sharper it is, the, the better allegedly is the system. Um, that's the one of the key aspects of physics to obtain a nice, well-rounded sigmoidal curve for your participants. Now, when you get drowsy, your sigmoidal curve is slightly less, you know precise so the precision of the system is lower or some people say that there's a relaxation some people who work in psychophysics model this effect by noise by adding noise in the model and they have this change so one type of noise makes you have let be less precise another type of change may, may noise might ask my may, may make you change the threshold but in our case clearly there's something changes in the system that make us about the stimuli in itself, um, compared to itself, compared to the same person but awake, okay? These are not two groups. It's yes, the same person, you know, compare awake and drowsy, awake and drowsy. And the trials are some, not all the trials of awake are at the beginning and all the trials of drowsy are at the, the middle or at the end. Actually, they become aware, you know, they become, you know, um, fully awake, then they, a few minutes they get drowsy, then they come back. So this is actually intermingled, interperse. So, um, Can I ask something, Tristan? Drowsy, you get you start to you start to see you know aspect of you know of precision of how many hits you do. Um, in the easy condition, you know you start to go down at the beginning of drowsiness. Oh, sorry, the beginning of drowsiness, you start to go down. Um, the difficult ones don't change that much. They start to they seem to change a bit more at the end of the drowsiness. So. This is interesting. So if you start to split, you see that the, the easy trials seem to be the ones that are suffering more than the actual difficult trials. We can discuss, you know, what this means exactly, you know, later. So if I take the brain activity and I look at the evoke potentials, um, the evoke potential when the, when the person hears the tone before starting the mask, um, in some participants, because of individual variability of doing the, the finding the you know their threshold, you have some participants where um, the mask uh, you can start the mask quite late, so they they are really sort of long distance participants. So yeah, you can even do an analysis of evoke potentials up until you know hundred and something, where the mask hasn't arrived yet, and in that case, the interesting thing is that you get this this effect of a change you know in the in the um, between being aware and unaware on the same stimuli so this is the part where um in the middle of the threshold of the of the task this this you know this uh type of uh condition um the person is um awake um and in red you can see between uh, awake aware and awake uh unaware and you have these two sort of lovely differences at the brain level early on. So I can differentiate with the brain activity. Can I can differentiate um, uh, between awake, aware, and awake, unaware. So again, this the world doesn't change. The brain is not changing because it's all awake. And I can. I have, it's going to be, you know, it's going to say, you know, it's going to be aware or unaware of the, you know, of the of the um, sound being there, aware that the sound was there, or you would say, no, it wasn't there, but actually it was. 
So unaware is that even if the sun was there, the sound, the target was there, the person says it wasn't. And I have this lovely difference at the brain activity level. But when you're drowsy in the blue, you also have a difference. So I, we can detect in both cases. That's fairly good, interesting. Um, when I go to the mask and I take the onset of the mask, yeah, the onset of the sound of the mask. So you hear the tone and the mask starts. Um, here in the awake, I can separate whether the mask, you know, it's a, a, in where, whether the mask uh, creates effect of awareness or sorry, aware or unaware in the red. So I can detect whether someone is going to be aware or unaware in the responses by the beginning of the brain activity of, you know, after the mask here. Only when you when you're a same same person, same sounds, same mask, same conditions, uh, the brain activity does not separate between the conditions of the person saying yes or, or no. Yes, it was there. Yeah, it wasn't. So that's important because what what it's saying is that the mask in itself, you know, brain activity to the mask, um, it's not informative that brain activity. It's not informative for me to say what the person is going to say later. So something happened uh, in the brain processing that when the person is drowsy, I cannot separate whether they're going to say aware or unaware. So they are doing it. I just don't have information in the brain activity to say whether they're going to be aware or unaware. So it's, it's on me to try to find it because clearly it's not happening at 100 milliseconds. While in a wake it is happening at 100 milliseconds, I, there's a nice difference between where between the brain activity to the mask when you're going to say aware or unaware. When you're drowsy, that's gone, and that's what it's sort of you know represented here. Now we can take a look again, um, a slightly different analysis, but the same thing. You have you know the the trials locked to the onset of the mask. This is mask evoke activity. Uh, between misses and hits, so aware and aware, you have the difference, you know, at, at you know, what is called the M-hand, which is 20-something, 80 milliseconds. You have at 200, and you have at 300. So, you know, we have the brain activity separating these three things. We have it in all three moments. That's when I put all the trials together. But if I separate them, um, then the, the game is different. At 100 milliseconds, I just showed you, um, 100 milliseconds in awake, I can separate between what it's aware, you know, so it's unaware to aware, but in, in, in drowsy, I can't. At 200 milliseconds, that difference, it's driven by the awake, uh, aware and unaware trials. The drowsy trials, they don't show me differences. And finally, at 300 milliseconds, I finally have a small but clear difference in drowsy between hits and misses or aware and aware and in awake. I'm going to show you, I'm going to zoom in that one a little bit. So at 200, between the red, awake, you know, um, aware and unaware, I have a difference. In the blue, which is aware and aware in drowsy, I have no difference. Later at 300, the difference between uh, between aware and aware it's clear in both cases in awake and in drowsy. There's something extremely important here, and you you might have seen those who work in ERP will be a bit surprised sometimes. The brain activity in general in drowsy is much higher. So when you get in drowsy and you hear a sound and mask, your brain goes like boom, like brutal brain activity, bigger bigger than the awake, than yourself awake, right? This is the same amount of, the same people, the same amount of trials, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, um, but even if the brain activity is higher, you know, uh, there are no differences at 200 here, and there are only differences at 300 in, in drowsy. This is, this is an interesting thing because it is a game between differentiation versus amount of energy, right? The amount of energy measured by ERP in the brain, the invoked 
activity to the mask is much higher, but the, the differentiation um, is not you know, much bigger, to be honest. It's just small, still there, uh, in both cases, awake and drowsy, but small. If we go inside and we look at when you do source reconstruction of all the trials and you look at what's going on in general, you define brain activity in the auditory because it's an auditory paradigm, frontal and parietal, because you want to see what's going on at the frontal parietal network, because that's the, allegedly the neural correlates of the big network of the conscious access. Um, we see something, you know, readily interesting. So when, when you take the source analysis and you take all of the trials together, you basically say, tell me the sources of absolutely all the trials, away, droughts, and et cetera, you obtain this big source, you know, uh, results. Then you, then you, you, you can, you can create an ROI of the left and right, you know, the little patat, that little, you know, potato of, um, in awake and drowsy, and then check what's going on in each of those. And what you see is that in awake, in the, in awake, you see the differences in 200 and 300 in frontal, but only in, in, in drowsy, you only see it in the front there. Okay. So in the frontal in 300, not in 200, again, like we were seeing just before. And the interesting thing is that it's almost gone in the, in the other hemisphere. So it's the left hemisphere of the left frontal ROI that it seems to be capturing that difference that we've seen in the drowsy um, at 300 milliseconds, the difference between being aware or being unaware. And when you look at the left parietal or right parietal or left temporal and right temporal, um, then you have nothing in the, in the drowsy. Nothing comes out in the drowsy in these ones. You get some, some effects of the awake, uh, uh, awake effect a little bit there, um, but the, the in frontal cortex is important and it's the only place where we seem to be able to, you know, find that representation of the difference between aware and unaware in drowsy. While in awake, it's most of the time, you know, in many other cortices, auditory, para, you know, auditory cortex, parietal, frontal. Um, there we are. So last analysis and I, and we can, you know, sort of relax and have the discussion. This is a bit, a bit more tricky, but if you take the EEG, and you do a global field power, what you take is you take all of the 120 ele electrodes and you ask mathematically, you know, show me the biggest difference you can get combining all of these electrodes into one time trace. That's the global field power. So the global field of the EEG and the in power. So you basically saying, I have 128 electrodes, give me the best out of them and show me the time course. So when you do that, you're basically exacerbating the time information. Uh, and then you take the different conditions and you check how does it look. So that the condition one, it's the condition that it's, there's a lot of masking. Um, the other condition um, is a lot of, there is less masking. So this is from the tone and the mask are very near, so it gets a lot of mask. Here it's less. So the idea is that if I have differences here, seconds in awake and in drowsy, I know that 100 milliseconds, the brain, you know, signals is changing a lot between different conditions. So I'm, now I'm, I'm trying to represent brain activity depending of, you know, the level of masking. If it was, you know, very difficult trials, very easy trials kind of thing. What we see here, and that's the only take home that I think is important, is that at 100 milliseconds, in a way, you have a sharp, you know, uh, difference at the brain activity that follows the relationship between the difficulty of the, you know, of the parameter of the masking. So the level of masking, more masking, more activity, less masking, less activity. Well, here it's also there, but it's very, it's fainter. While later at 200 milliseconds, 
that effect is still there in the awake, but it's sharper and stronger in drowsy. So that's interesting because this is suggesting that the signal that um, that the, the brain signal that somehow represents the difficulty of you know the level of masking, the level of how much you're going to become aware of something or not, happens very early when you're awake, and it sort of gets delayed in drowsy. Same people, same conditions, etc. So this is still happening, but you know it gets delayed to secondary cortices, if you want, or frontal cortex, you know, or coming from the auditory to the frontal cortex. And surprisingly, at 300 milliseconds, where you suppose you have these differences between conditions, as per the model of, you know, of the global neural workspace, there are no differences there. So the P300 doesn't care anymore this, this, this of whether you are, you know, whether you, what was the degree of the, you know, what was the strength of the ma of the masking itself, it looks like it only cares whether you were you were able to detect it in in the in the cortices earlier. So in order not to lag too much, I'm going to just jump, you know, to some of the conclusions, and we can come back and look at the details if we want uh, in particular. So just to try to wrap up and and allow you to think about this, you know, relatively complicated thing. Um, in the, in the terms that we are discussing, so we have this decrease, decrease sensitivity, this change, you know, in the in the decision that, that the criterion becomes a bit more, uh, um, let's say, liberal. You have more noise in the system. But detection and discrimination depend on different tasks. We know what the people are drawing; so they can still do in the task, but in general, they effectively have lower D prime. So they, they do the task in a less, less efficient manner. So if we calculate D prime, we have less sensitivity and lower D prime, um, but don't have a change in threshold, which is a rather interesting sort of differentiation. And this happens again in several of these tasks, not only the conscious access, although bear in mind the conscious access. We have a delayed effect on, on reaching the action, on reaching the, you know, the, the actual sort of response. And if you think about evidence accumulation, Maybe it's because the, the information is not going through, in this case, from the auditory cortex to the you know, global neural workspace. It's not going in a, in a high fidelity system. It's not going in, in, a, in an efficient manner. Maybe it's because of the drowsiness creates some sort of noise between the auditory cortex and the frontoparietal system. Maybe because it has a change at the frontoparietal system. We still don't know, but we assume there's definitely something that it's happening um, at several stages. Um, but it's not affecting the, the motor action. So, actually, so if anything, the, the drowsiness effect, the homeostasis, is modulating perceptual and central decisions, but not action. And we have evidence of that, right? Um, so, how do we interpret this? So, the neural correlates from seems to shift in the two analysis. Maybe they shift from you know. 100 milliseconds and 200 milliseconds, I can detect the difference between an aware, aware and unaware trials in the wake, but not in the drowsy. In drowsy, I only, def I only detect the aware and aware difference at the P300, 300 milliseconds later. While if I try to look at the neural you know, association of the level of information I give, you know, the amount of masking, in a wake, I see it 100 milliseconds and at 200, in, in drowsy, I see it at 200. So it gets shifted again, that differentiation of the amount of information that, that I get from the mask. So we got this sort of, you know, push, you know, push of the, push on the neural correlates of what, what can we get from them. Does this mean that the, that the whole process is sort of shifting later or is that the, the information, um, it's not, you know, it knows high fidelity, so it can really be discriminated later. That's part of the discussion of what we need to sort of capture in this program of research, not just in this experiment. So we have these behavioral and neural markers of consciences and conscious state and, you know, are state dependent, right? Because if you're drunk, you're awake, you have a different behavior and different neural markers. They, the neural markers change and the behavioral precision also changes. Um, the steep lobe that 
it's a, a, a tenet, a basic aspect of, uh, of the idea of all or non consciousness. You either are aware or unaware in a very sort of, you know, jumpy manner, all or non, you know, non linear jump manner, sigmoidal, you know, discrimin discriminability. Maybe it's not so much. Maybe the more, the more, you know, the more the system becomes drowsy in this case, or, the, or noisy or whatever is happening, the less, you know, jumpy is and the more gradual it becomes. Um, so we know the neural dynamics of masking gets delayed with low alertness and the shift in the neural reorganization of the conscious access. It looks like the neural system is reconfiguring to do the same task. You still have conscious access or not conscious access, but it's happening in a different manner. It seems to be that it's reorganizing itself to happen later. Because if you want to think about compensatory mechanisms, we're getting drowsy. And there's a neural system that compensates for that. And maybe it's not as efficient as, as the neural system, you know, at play when you're awake, but still gets the job done. Maybe it's slightly later, slightly less efficiently, but it still gets the job done. Um, so that's the idea of the reconfiguration of neural resources to solve the same task. So is this a case of quick plasticity compensate? You know, what kind of, you know, um, physiological sort of um, con conceptual framework we use for this? It's also up for grabs. Right. I hope we can, you know, uh, I gave you an, an impression of what this paper is about and the general aspect of wakefulness versus awareness, wakefulness versus cognition, uh, and we can have a, a nice discussion.